This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecki is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Gwilda Wiecki's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Science of Magic or endorsed in any manner by Gwilda Wiecki, Relmar McConnell Media Company, its affiliated networks, stations, or employees. Welcome to the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecka, a program dedicated to uncovering the unified nature of reality and humanity's ever-evolving place as truly galactic beings. For more information on the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiecka, visit us online at www.thescienceofmagic.net. Welcome to the Science of Magic, a program combining the science and magic of today's leading topics to co-create new solutions and promote evolutionary thinking. We're coming to you through the leader in responsible paranormal and alternative science programming, the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, and can also be found on our website, thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. This hour, we'll be exploring my soul to take. I was very young the five-by-five-foot hole on the stage floor of the church, dark and deep. The minister stood waist-deep in the cold water before reaching to take me from my grandmother's arms into the great abyss. I'm sure he saw me as a nasty little heathen as I shimmied up his body in an attempt to escape my watery fate, no doubt leaving claw marks in my desperation. My terrified screams echoed off the vaulted ceiling, until, with no little glee, he muttered something about sin and dunked me under, head and all. It seemed like forever before he brought me back to the surface, gasping, sputtering, and trembling. During my time underwater, I became convinced they were going to drown me, like my grandmother had threatened to do with unwanted barn kittens. I left something in that watery grave, but it was not my terrible sin. I left my divinity. I left my connection with God. After all, in my little child's mind, if I was so defective that even God dictated they should drown me to wash away my sin, I must be bad indeed. I've been judged and found wanting. God found me lacking, not worthy to be in his presence. My nighttime prayer, if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take, became a threat of doom. Through the experience of baptism, I became convinced God wouldn't take me. And we all know what that means. I'd be left to the red guy with a pitchfork, horns, and pointy tail. My grandmother didn't understand why I was suddenly terrified to go to sleep. At the age of four, I had no way to explain to her I was afraid I'd die before I woke up. My dreams were plagued by the minister's grim face, distorted by the surface of the water as I looked up helplessly. I saw the red guy in the shadows of my bedroom, but the worst was the feeling of shame and hopelessness. The thundering blow came in Bible school when I was informed that Jesus died for our sins. I'd always loved Jesus. I treasured the little picture my grandmother had given me of the kindly blue-eyed man holding a lamb. Maybe God had no use for me, but I was assured Jesus loved little children. Surely that meant he loved me too, didn't it? Now come to find out he died because of my sin? And what exactly was sin, anyway? I spent a great part of my adulthood researching that very question.
from degrees in psychology and religious studies to extensive training in shamanism and esoteric practices, I pondered the concept of sin and found myself none the wiser. No matter how I studied the scriptures, though I found references to us being made in God's image, I couldn't find why we were supposed to have been born flawed. Totally frustrated, I finally formed my own hypotheses based upon numerous studies. When we're born into the world, we have to leave the land of unity or spirit. Sin is the suffering one endures as a result of separation from spirit or from God. Now that made sense to me. It wasn't something we did wrong, but rather original sin is the original separation. Forgiveness could then be achieved by reconnecting with spirit, a worthy endeavor I've wholeheartedly pursued ever since. <laughs> but what do I know? Our guest this hour may have some enlightening viewpoints on the subject of original sin. With us this hour is Danielle Schirer, Schirer, an author, speaker, pastor, and founder, founding member of the Emerging Church Movement. She's the author of Original Blessing, Putting Sin in Its Rightful Place, Where Jesus Prayed, Illuminations on the Lord's Prayer in the Holy Land, and The Boundary-Breaking God, An Unfolding Story of Hope and Promise. She holds a B.A. from Bachelor Bayer University and a Master's of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. Danielle lives with her husband and two children in Dallas, Texas. After this commercial break, I'll introduce Danielle, and together we'll explore sin, blessing, and divinity. So don't go away. You're listening to The Science of Magic. Our current episodes are aired daily on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the Exxon Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Nemology Science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Nemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today. Know the name, know the person. Or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere, Florida. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine such as hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a Southern Flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining rooms can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you visit, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic downtown Felsmere, or visit 
marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, Old Florida cuisine at its best. If you're a seeker, don't miss the inspiring book, Shamanic Awakening, Between the Dark and the Daylight. This remarkable work chronicles shamanic counselor and indigenously trained dream decoder Sander Cochran's 35 years of experience with diverse wisdom keepers throughout the Americas. Sandy's initiations across the British Isles, Turkey, Greece, and Egypt, combined with her knowledge of symbology, psychology, and myth, influence her dream blog and workshops. Sandy offers private readings, sacred international journeys, a meditative CD, and her book, Shamanic Awakening, to encourage you as you navigate your earthwalk and create a deeper connection to yourself. Find this and more at her website, starwalkervisions.com. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Daniel Schroyer, author of Original Blessing, Putting Sin in Its Rightful Place, pastor and founding member of the Emerging Church Movement. Her website is danielschroyer.com. Danielle, thank you so much for joining us on the Science of Magic. Thanks so much for having me. Let's start by addressing original sin. I understand that it's, it's uh, not in the early Christian teachings. What is it, and where did the concept come from? Yeah, people are usually surprised to hear that it hasn't always been a, a central Christian doctrine. Um, it didn't really come into play until about um, the 5th century. So for the first 400 years of Christian history, which, if you think about it, was kind of whether the time when either Christianity was going to stick around as a, as a world religion for a long time or die out and kind of become a has-been of history, um, the Church didn't, didn't hold to a doctrine of original sin. And even today, the Eastern branch of Christianity, Eastern Orthodox and Armenian Christian and um, the entire Eastern branch, they have never adopted uh, the doctrine of original sin is a central thing. Now, they have a concept of sin, of course, but it's much more nuanced and healthy, um, and it's very different than what we what we adopted in the West. So, And then, of course, if we think about it, no Jewish person believes in the doctrine of original sin, and it was certainly their story first, and no Muslims believe in the doctrine of original sin either. So it's only just this little Western part of Christianity that has decided that that's what the story means. Well, my original teacher, I'm based in shamanism, my original teacher was a Lakota elder and shaman, and he was also a devout Christian, and he didn't, um, well, he didn't really ever speak of sin at all. What is sin? (laughs) Yeah, I have a couple of Native American um, Christian friends as well, and they're, they're, the way that they talk about sin, if they talk about it, is is definitely uh, much more healthy and nuanced. Um, The broadest way of of talking about sin perhaps is to say that it's it's a maybe a movement away from life is maybe the way that I would define it um so you move toward um destruction or degradation or disconnection um and something that would move you away from that sense of unity like you talked about would be something that maybe you could one could label sin um yeah that's one way of looking at it so like moving away from your natural expression yeah yes yeah, that, that agrees with the shamanic viewpoint as well. As, as, as the stronger we are in our natural expression, the closer we are to the way we were made. And guess who made us, right? Yes, exactly. And a sin is something that takes us away from who we are, not something that expresses who we are, which is, is how I, I see that differently than, than people who believe in original sin do. So if we're standing more in the true expression of who we are, does that place us closer to all that is, uh, slash God? Yes, and that's really that's really my point in, in trying to encourage people to think about original blessing instead of original sin, because original sin is, starts by saying, hey, you're separated from God. There's this problem of disconnection that you have, and you, and, and you need to fix it. But you can't fix it, so you need Jesus to fix it. 
Um, but even after Jesus fixes it for you, you're still always going to be disconnected because um, you have this sin nature and it, it never goes away. Whereas original blessing is a way of saying, um, did you know that you were born connected to God and to all of creation? You were designed for connection. Um, and regardless of how you're doing with that connection right now, know that that's actually the heart of your, that's the heart of your being. That's who you are at your core. Um, and you can always return to that place. So what is baptism and where did it originate? So it's really interesting, actually, the whole concept of baptism has, has uh, morphed and changed over the years. And of course, baptism for Christians came from a Jewish uh, experience of baptism, which was um, partly ritual cleaning um, in, in their understanding. And so there, there are just many, many layers, of course, in, in all rituals in what they mean. But at least in Christian experience, um, to me, there was this switch between baptism being a symbol of death and rebirth to baptism being a symbol of being washed away from wash, washing your sins away. Um, and of course, sin is always part of the, the act of, of rebirth. Like you say, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm having my sins washed away because it's part of being reborn. But it wasn't the central thing. It wasn't the main part. Um, and I think what happened in Western Christianity is, is that they made baptism only about the removal of sin. And it was kind of convenient because you could only have that removal of sin if you came to the church and got it. So it was a, a nice little encouragement to get people to come to church because it's the only place you could, you could get that washing that you needed. Yeah, and don't forget to pass around the plate, right? Yes, right. Yeah, make sure you're here, and by the way, here's your, t you know, offer up your ties. <laughs> exactly. So. so I find it interesting the way that, um, in again, the shamanic practice, in order to reunite with our natural expression, sometimes there's rituals used that use the element of water or air or earth or fire. And water is really commonly used, particularly in Celtic shamanism, which is attached at the hip to Catholicism. So I wonder if those relate. What do you think? Yeah, I I do I do think they relate, and I think there's something really powerful about using um, our natural world to reflect these these large um, sort of spiritual realities that we're trying to express. I, I love the fact that ritual always pulls in something tangible, and to me, um, certainly in Celtic spirituality, water is really powerful, and even in like Jungian psychology, water is this um, deeply uh, primal feminine energy that is that is about birth and rebirth, and so we can even connect it to to that and say that there's something womb like about this this act of going underneath the water and coming back out of the water. So, what does it mean to be saved? Well, that's the million dollar question, right? Um, I think it means something much broader than just Jesus died for your sins, which really isn't technically what the gospel says anyway. Um, if anything, Jesus died for your death, I would say, is maybe more specific. Um, and certainly, again, your sin is caught up in that. But it's an act of saying being saved is the practice and act of um, allowing God to help you reconnect with all things, but also your own human choices in connecting to those things that are going to bring you life. And so salvation is something that's done to you by God, I would say there's something that's like that we can't do about it, but it's also something that we are designed to do, and so we are active in our own salvation as well. And I think we we underestimate that often in um, in the way that many Christians in the West talk about it. So, are you talking about salvation like the act of reconnecting with all that is? Yeah, I would say it's simply the act of deciding to move toward life in all the things that you do. That's the end game. I mean, the, the point of, of life to me, at least in Scripture, is, is life and wisdom. That's, that's why we're here. And so that, that has to come through connection with other people. What's the, what benefit is there in convincing us of our supposedly sinful nature? What was the purpose of that? <laughs> Yeah, I don't actually know. Um, I, I think it's a terrible, um, I talk about in the book about that being like the elevator pitch of American Christianity. Is there something wrong with you and you have this in nature? And I, I don't find that compelling at all. I think it's much more compelling to say, did you have any idea that you're connected um, to all of creation? And to me, that's a much more compelling story. So I would much rather spend my time talking about that. Well, it does make a lot more sense with the, in the scriptures where it says we were created in God's image. Yeah, yeah, definitely. 
definitely. And although some some people that maybe would believe in original sin say, yeah, we know that we were created in God's image, but then something changed. I would say, well, no, nothing changed. You can read Genesis 3 a million times, and there's no way in which it says that image of God was tarnished or harmed or permanently disfigured. It's just not in that story. So I think that that's, that's the thing that we rely upon. Yeah, I want to go into Genesis 3 later, because um, that's a fascinating place to start. So, <laughs> But what can you tell us about guilt and shame and how it's being used to control? Yeah, I, I do think that what's unfortunately happened when you focus on sin as like the big issue instead of it being about life and death and life being, of course, about connection, um, what ends up happening is that it's, it's similar to what you were saying in your own experience, that there's a sense in which you feel like someone's out to get you. And that someone is God, which is, you know, terrible because we're supposed to have this, you know, I think benevolent view of um, the creator. And instead you have this, this deep fear um, and this sense that you just aren't ever going to be good enough. And uh, it's, a, it's really hard to be able to live rightly and to make those choices about being a person who, who seeks life and who seeks justice and goodness and connection when you feel like there's always something wrong with you. And so, um, yeah, I think it's just an incredibly harmful view to, to claim that there's something innately wrong with us. You know, it seems like uh, one of the arguments I've heard towards guilt is that it controls people and keeps them from doing bad things. Do you think without guilt uh, to control them, people would do more bad things? I think that uh, people make worse choices out of guilt and shame, actually. I think that um, if you really want to see people make wise decisions, or if you think of the people that you know who seem to be the most wise in the way that they choose to live their lives, they're not controlled by guilt or shame. And so um, I think there is something to say about people being certainly controlled by fear. I mean, if you look around America right now, we certainly see signs that people are, um, are allowing their anxieties and fears to dictate their, their actions in ways that aren't healthy or helpful. Um, that, that, it just, that isn't the best way. I just don't think that's the way we're supposed to be living. So guilt is pretty darned uncomfortable, and pretty soon we end up trying to get rid of it by projecting it on others. Do you see that as how we're acting out in a bad way as a result of guilt? Yeah, I do. And there's, um, I don't know if you've heard of um, mimetic theory. Rene Girard is a philosopher, but he says that basically there's this scapegoat theory that we all live into because of this guilt. Um, and he says, you know, we'll always find someone, some scapegoat to put our, our fears and our blames on because we don't want to have it. Um, and I think that's true. You know, all the ways that we scapegoat other people and sort of make other people pu- be paid and pay and be punished for the things that we're afraid of, um, that all comes, I think, from that place of, of feeling out of control of our own lives. And I think that if we empower people and say, you have what you need, <laughs> everything, is, everything is available to you, then we actually can release our sense of anxiety and make um, healthier choices. So we have just a little bit left in this, in this segment. Uh, isn't shame pay, playing in here? You know, the shame and, combined with the guilt creating the projection. Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. And there's, it's, as a pastor, you know, I had so many people that were what we call recovering from fundamentalists come to my church, and they, they had just been told for so long growing up that there were these things that were wrong with them that it just took so long to, to get out from underneath that shame. And, um, you know, it's, it's a beautiful process to watch when somebody finally decides to let go of that. Uh, because you see who they are actually start to manifest. You see them become creative, and you see them become empowered, and you see them just start to shine. And um, to me, that's, that's the benefit of saying, this is not something worth living into. This shame is too heavy for me to bear, and it's unnecessary. It. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to take a break. Danielle and I will return to our discussion on the other side of this break, so don't go away. We're coming to you through the Exxon Broadcast Network. Don't miss the other fine shows and hosts on xzbn.net, and there's a gang of them. You're listening to The Science of Magic, your resource for creative solutions in a changing world, thescienceofmagic.net.
This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. There's a legend shared by many indigenous cultures of a time when the nations were cast to the four corners of the world. Each nation was given a body of sacred knowledge that held a different portion of the truth to preserve. True reality could not be known until all the nations reunited, combining the information. If a single one was missing, the world could not be reborn and darkness would prevail. The Science of Magic Radio is dedicated to reuniting the sacred knowledge. With the understanding, none of us has all the answers, but together we can open new perceptions and possibilities. Through our combined vision, the world can be reborn into a place where darkness no longer prevails. Join me, Gwilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic daily on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, or visit us at thescienceofmagic.net. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at... Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7, 365. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, a place where magic and science come together to promote enlightenment. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. We cover what's hot for in-depth exploration of leading-edge subjects from numerous authorities and viewpoints. Join our email family to receive our topic-driven episode collections at thescienceofmagic.net. Our guest this hour is Danelle Schroyer, author of Original Blessing, 
putting sin in its rightful place. Dino, let's talk about physicality. Again, my uh, shamanic teacher said that God put us in bodies because we needed to be the bridge between spirit and the mundane. Do you see the current interpretation of sin causing us to judge against being in physical form? Um, gosh, that's a really large question. Um, <laughs> we could talk for six hours about that. Uh, I would, I would say that, um, in my view, human, our human bodies are, are good and they are not a, they don't keep us from doing what we need to do. So they, we are capable of, of channeling the divine through our bodies, um, not despite them, if that makes sense. Um, and so, of course, I, I'm a follower of Jesus who thinks that um, in, in whatever form Jesus connected human and divine, that that is actually something that we're all capable of, of, of living into as fully as he did, and that he actually tells us that, like, you, you will do even greater things than I have. And so um, I don't see the human body as something that we have to overcome or that we even have to see as secondary in any way, but that it's actually um, designed to be empowered by spirit. Yeah, all his miracles happened through his body, didn't they? Yes, and in very physical forms, like picking up mud and, um, you know, washing in water. Again, that water comes back and is, is in that way a symbol of healing. And so um, I think there's something wonderfully tangible about all the ways that Jesus was present to people. So where did the concept of him dying for our sins originate? What's that about? Yeah, um, you know, that's another million-dollar question. Uh, he certainly talked about dying for our sins as being part of it, but it was also, I think, an act of him being in solidarity with human suffering. Um, it's, it's, we're all happy to say that Jesus was in solidarity with human joy or with human goodness or whatever, but, but uh, the difficult times when we really are, are in, in dark places, to know that um, the divine one is present to us in those moments is really powerful. And so to me, what the cross shows is, is deep solidarity with humanity, even, even at our worst, um, that even in those places we're not beyond spirit or beyond goodness. Mm. Yeah, beautiful example. So let's go to Genesis 3. Tell us about your understanding of the story of Genesis 3. Well, actually, I just returned to not only the, the early church uh, understanding of Genesis 3 in a lot of ways, but also a Jewish one. Um, I studied Hebrew in school for a long time and um, really just fell in love with the Hebrew language. And it's hard to read Genesis 3 and get any sense in which you come out with the idea of original sin because it's just not in there. It's not in the story. So to me, Genesis 3 is a story of coming of age. It's um, the story of two humans who are, of course, symbols of humanity in general. Um, and they had a lovely childhood growing up in this garden where they were cared for and loved with this divine parent who gave them what they needed. But um, it was time for them to individuate and to grow up and to have to make the same kinds of decisions that they made in the garden, outside of the garden. But if you read the text, it's obvious that they were never supposed to stay there. Like God created this whole world, and the garden was only one part of this world. And so even when God, we think that um, a lot of the translations that we've read in, in the Bible say that God banished them, but actually it was God sending them away. And there's this sense of like peaceful benediction, like go forth and, and do what you need to do. And um, so you don't get the sense that God is angry about it. It's just an act of, okay, well, now you've grown up and it's time for you to have to make choices in a world that's filled with both good and evil. So in that, in that view, um, what was eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? What does that stand for? I think that stands for just coming of age. Like you become a teenager and think, you know, I've got, it's time for me to question what my parents tell me because it's not my choice until I realize that I have one. <laughs> and so God wants us, I think, to, to reflect love back and to reflect connection back. Um, but at some point, we have to make that decision for ourselves and do that um, because we want to do that, not just because it's the only thing we know. And so to me, the knowledge of good and evil, that tree, is um, we have to partake of that and Im imbibe that um, for us to actually grow in wisdom. So it's, it's kind of like polarization and judgment, good and evil. 
are you saying that we have to move into polarization before we can evolve back into unity? Well, yeah, I mean, I would maybe say in a union sense, it's like you, you have to confront your shadow, maybe, that there's this sense in which you, um, you don't negate the parts of yourself that are maybe going to sometimes make the wrong choice or the, the des- desires that you have that are sometimes good and sometimes geared towards things that are destructive, that you take both of those things and you, you receive them totally instead of saying, I'm only going to pay attention to this one side. And when you do that, you come to acceptance about the fullness of your humanity. And in that you find, I think, um, a sense of transformation and you have grace upon yourself and others to where you're, you're able to be compassionate and empathetic and, um, yeah, maybe have your eyes more wide open. So that takes us right back full circle into full acceptance of ourselves as yeah. the, the way to unify. Yes. And I think it's how, I think that's what makes justice possible. Like we, we can see injustice in the world and say, uh, that's not right, you know, which is a negation, but it's an important negation because it's standing up for life and connection. We say we see that disconnection and we're not okay with it. And so I think that, that eating of the knowledge of the good, of good and evil is, is an act of saying we're making space for all kinds of things, rebellion, yes, but also justice, and um, that's important. You can't unify a thing if you can't see it, right? Yeah, right. And there's no sense in which, you know, as innocent as kids are, I I mentioned Peter Pan in the book because I think it's a good example. Like, if you just are unwilling to grow up and see the world in all of its fullness, goodness, good and bad, you end up being Peter Pan. And that's nobody's desire, right? The way that you become someone like Gandhi or Thomas Merton or the Buddha is because you've you've seen and experienced all of you, all of all of human experience and and then you're able again to to move toward unity even despite that and that's the real maturity I think mm. you know many spiritual texts and teachings and stories contain messages that are metaphorical do you see some of the bib- biblical references as allegories I see most of them as allegories. Yeah, I don't. I don't take very much uh, literally. I mean, well, I say that I take some of the things literally, but particularly in Genesis three. I mean, you know, this is supposed to be a deeply metaphorical story about about the origins of humanity and who we are and who we're supposed to be and the meaning of life. I mean, there's a lot of really big things in there, but um, I don't. I don't take it to be this literal story, and uh, I think it gets really complicated when we when we try to read it that way. It's exactly the same way with shamanic information. It comes forth through stories and allegory. And if you take them literally, boy, can you really get balled up. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. It makes a bit of a mess of things, which it was supposed to be poetic, and we made it something so much uglier than that. So Yeah. So you see our relationship with God started with blessing. Would you please explain? Yeah, I say that... Um, the, the easiest definition of original blessing is that we're in a relationship with God, and God started it, and God is sticking with it. And that's simply to say um, we always trust that no matter what else is happening, that we can return to that place in which we are beloved by God. Um, it's very similar, actually, to the Buddhist concept of basic human goodness, that there's a sense in which we have basic human goodness that resides inside of us, even if we're not acting out of it. You know, we can always choose to return to basic human goodness. It's always available for us. And I would say that's the same with blessing. So if we are born unified with God, but then we, through the bumps and bruises and shame and blame and all this stuff, disconnect, it doesn't mean God's not there. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it means that God is always present. And then even if we are trying to disconnect, um, and we have to acknowledge the times when we do move toward disconnection, like I said, in places of injustice or when we, when we're, we violently do harm to others or to creation. Uh, we, you know, the, that we see the signs of that. We see what happens when, when those choices are made. Um, but we also trust that God never severs that connection with us, that there's no way in which we get lost to the presence of God or to, to the divine in us. Tell us about one of your favorite verses from reading the book, um, Isaiah 43, verse 1. Why is that so profound? Uh, I, that's, I, I talk about in the book how I was a, a chaplain for um, people with Alzheimer's. I was in a retirement community, and that's the, the verse that I 
probably said over people the most often, and I'm not one that goes around quoting verses, but I think it just feels so deeply personal because it's God's acknowledgement, like, I know you. You are you are beloved. You are mine. I have called you by name. Um, and I think really... Um, what we, that's what we need more than anything, most of all. We need our parents to say that to us. And if we didn't have our parents to say that to us, we, we feel this sense of loss that we didn't have unconditional love given to us as children. And I think that's what God seeks to offer to us is the sense of you are loved simply by being alive, by breathing. You don't have to earn it. You, don't, you can't lose it. You can't do enough bad things to, to go away from it. Um, I've called you by name and you're mine. And I and think that when we rest in that, we can we can make better decisions. It it is such a beautiful verse, such a beautiful verse, and the con the concept of um, of being whole within yourself and being okay like you are um, is viewed as a shamanic access to um, the other world. That you can't move through a facility that isn't accepted and um, embraced. How does that relate to what you're telling me? I would say that there's a sense in which um, that's what incarnation is, right? Like this, this connection between the human and the divine and that you, you are aware of the fact that you can, you can be present to the spiritual reality in all things um, because you're open to it and maybe because that original blessing designed you to be able to see it and notice it and live into it. The reconnection... Does that come through metaphor as well? Hmm. Like the messages that we get in the current time. Yeah, I yeah, I think it does. And I but I would say sometimes it just shows up in physical ways too. Like I'm sure you've had experiences where you think, Oh, well <laughs> that metaphor just became like a a neon sign out my door or there's a bumper sticker that is exactly telling me what the universe needs to tell me right now. Um so I think, I don't know if that's what you're getting at, but I, I think that, um, yeah, that sometimes we see even in the physical world, like this, this thing that reminds us of this bigger spiritual reality and we're kind of hit over the head with it, or we feel it okay. physically in our bodies because of we're, it. We're going to have to take another break. Janelle and I will be back shortly, so don't leave us now. This is the Science of Magic, the scienceofmagic.net, your resource to altruistic professionals of science and the esoteric working to create common ground for the betterment of our world. We're in this together. Your thoughts are very important. If you have any comments or topics of interest to suggest, please email me at info at thescienceofmagic.net. affiliates and satellite program providers including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. I am Dr. 
Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? I'm Dr. Kimberly McGeorge, and on The Secret to Everything, we will merge the practical with open investigation into all realms of the mysterious. We will talk to cutting-edge alternative health practitioners, those who inspire and motivate you in business and life, and of course, we will share stories of the paranormal, conspiracy, and cryptozoology. You will transform because of the frequency I carry, the frequencies my guests carry. Life may never be the same after you listen to this program. For the secret to everything is for you, the listener. For those who desire more in every area of their lives and believe that it can still be found. Listen and discover the secret to everything.com. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an eight-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at songsandstoriesforsoldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, bringing together gifted people of service to the world. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. What's up in your world? Email me at info at thescienceofmagic.net and suggest, suggest a topic that's on your mind. You're probably not the only one interested. Our guest this hour is Danell Schroyer, author of Original Blessing, Putting Sin in Its Rightful Place. Danell, one of the things that we're bridging here with science and magic and shamanism and spirituality is... Um, how we can get, day, you know, current day information from spirit, from the invisible realm, and translate it into our daily lives. What do you have to say about that? Hmm. I think most um, major religions have spiritual practices that sort of open up a space for that to happen. So prayer and meditation, I think, would probably be my my quickest go tos to answer that question. Um, of ways that we can sort of have open communication uh, with God and, and hopefully respond in kind in the way that we receive those things. You know, as we were going into our last break, you were talking about how sometimes these um, um, messages become very physical, something that an, an omen or yeah. whatever that happens in your daily life. Would you mind giving an example? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, my spiritual director, who's actually Native American as well, um, talks about that a lot. Like you, you sort of have to pay attention not only to your your waking life and your dreams, but um, but just these things that sort of manifest. So I would maybe say, I remember a number of years ago I was uh, just struggling through a change and and needing to make some big decisions, and I actually got pneumonia. And uh, it was, I, I'm never sick. And I was just out for a couple of weeks. And I went to go talk to my spiritual director. And she said, so what you're saying is you can't breathe? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, right, yes, this is, this is it, you know. So it was, it was a, a physical manifestation of, of, 
you know, this sort of spiritual struggle that I was going through. And certainly when we read about the saints and um, the mystics, you hear things like that all the time, that they sort of physically had these these ways of being, um, yeah, connected. And that was a negative example, but certainly I've had some positive ones as well. Our guest is Sarah Stanell Schroyer, author of Original Blessing, Putting Sin in Its Rightful Place. Her website is DanelleSchroyer.com. Uh, let's talk about perceived separation from God or from spirit. If we consider all-encompassing nature of, of God alone, there can be no such thing. So why do so many of us experience this separation? Yeah, that is a really good question, and um, I don't actually know the answer to that. I think that it is a false perception, um, and I do know that, of course, as humans, we get false perceptions all the time. We think that somebody was rude in an email when they didn't mean that at all, or we think that somebody doesn't like us when they like us just fine. So I think in that sense, um, sometimes from from the divine, we get a sense of false perception that there's, that there's a disconnection. And um, that's, I don't know, I think that usually has something to do with how we're how we're experiencing life. Um, But my sort of response to that is I I think the truest and deepest reality of creation is connection. And that um, when we kind of can let go of whatever it is that's making us feel disconnected uh, and we can trust in that, we'll, we'll find that it's maybe been there all along. So there's much talk currently from the quantum physics viewpoint that all things are connected. And you state, you state all of life is connected to God. Would you address that for us? How do those two tie together? Uh, yeah, I love quantum physics. And I, it's so fascinating because um, it also has this mysticism to it. Like you, you try to watch what's happening in quantum physics and it hides, you know. And I think that's so true of uh, the spiritual world as well. That you're, if you get to, try to get it too, too nailed down, you know, if you pin the butterfly, there's, it's, there's no way to do that. Um, but yeah, I do think that there are these sort of multiple layers of reality going on at all time. And of course, yesterday we found out that there are all these other planets that are potentially habitable that are, that, uh, they just found. Did you hear that news yesterday? So no, that's exciting. Yeah, seven Goldie, well, three for sure are Goldilocks planets, um, that, that are capable of producing life, um, in the Trappist galaxy. But anyway, we're learning all the time that we really don't know as much as we think we know about the universe. But what we do know, it does so point deeply to connection. And so I think even when we're not feeling that emotionally, we can sort of rely on the science of the thing and say, connection is the the fabric of the universe. That's just the truth. Isn't it fun to watch science and magic or, or spirituality come together in these days? Yes, yes. It's always really enlightening. It's, it really is. Let's talk about love. Where does love play in here? <laughs> well, certainly love is about um, about blessing, about resting in that sense that you are loved no matter what. Um, and I do think that that's, um, that's the way that we can stay connected to one another and to creation is that we, um, we seek to do to right by the environment because there's a sense of belovedness that we have for the trees and what they provide for us and for the water and what it provides for us. Um, and that, of course, there's a sense of belovedness that we, we receive when we are sitting at the top of a mountain and looking over all of that beautiful creation and, and acknowledging that. So I do think that love undergirds and allows for creation or for connection to happen. So how does God relate to love? Well, I think the simplest definition of God is love. So um, to say that God is love is to say um, that, that, and I, the way that I talk about the spirit is that the spirit is the love that is connecting um, you and I, that, 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 that place of connection between us is the act of love. And that, that's where the spirit is present to us. So to me, I think that, that God is the love. You say, and I quote, (laughs) every religion in the world lives at the intersection of the presence of the divine and the reality of humanity. Would you explain what you mean there? Yeah, um, we we're constantly trying to make sense of the ways that we bump up against um, the spiritual and the bigger than us. And um, so I think to uh, to me, all the interesting questions that we have in the world uh, come at that intersection where our human experience bumps up against something so far beyond human experience, and that we're just we're constantly playing around in that playground because it's kind of an endless it's an endless one. 
you know, the past hour talking to you, it sounds to me like you're dancing where um, all spirituality meets, not just this faith or that faith or the next faith, but where, where all spirituality comes together. And how did we get so off track from that? How do we get so mired in original sin and all these concepts? Yeah, it, it is a great question, and I don't, I don't know. I it it saddens me to think of how um, Western Christianity has become so mired in um, something that I I perceive to be so negative and so against the task of of humankind. Um, and I I don't really know where we got here, how we got here. I it's it's heartbreaking. So I hope that as people. Um, look around at the the problems that we're having and recognize that whatever we're trying to do to fix those things aren't working, maybe they'll realize, oh, there's got to be a better way to address this. And um, to me, connection is always going to be the better way. Love is going to be the better way. Peace is going to be the better way. And um, even though they're harder in a lot of respects, I I think that, um, I don't know, the proof is in the pudding, right? Who is upset when they choose love? Mm-hmm. There you go. So what's holistic spirituality? That's just a sense in which you, you try to acknowledge um, wholeness instead of, of seeing humanity or your, your body as, as something broken or something that's, uh, that's needing to be fixed. You take your, your whole experience of life and um, you include all of creation inside of that and say that um, whatever spirituality you have, it has to make sense in a in a full sense, and so instead of saying you're wrong or you're bad or you're you're separated or disconnected, you say instead that there's there's a wholeness that's integral to the way that the world is made, and that that is where um, you're supposed to find yourself. Mm. We have about a minute left or two. What would be the first step that you would suggest for people to start to embrace the original blessing and step out of the shame? Hmm. I have often encouraged people if they do feel like shame is is overwhelming them to just take five minutes a day and to sit in meditation and just to allow that word beloved um, to be spoken over them. That Isaiah passage that I have called you by name, you are mine. Um, If you can meditate on that every day, and try to release yourself from that shame and realize that there's this undergirding connection and love and belovedness that you have. Um, that's a good practice. Mm. How does original blessing help us find a more holistic spirituality? I think because it returns us to that connection, it reminds us that we're not aliens, you know, that we're not foreigners, um, but that we are designed specifically to be in relationship with the divine and um, that we have all that we need to do that. Well, Danielle, it's been a real pleasure sharing thoughts and feelings from very different standpoints, from science, from magic, from religion, and from shamanism. So it's just been a pleasure having you on. I can't thank thank you enough for being here. Do you have anything? Thank you so much. Do you have anything to share in parting? I just want to thank you for for having me on today. It's been an interesting conversation. It's, It's been a lot of fun. Been a lot of fun. Hopefully we'll do it again sometime. Our guest this hour has been Danielle Schreier. She's the author of The Original Blessing, Putting Sin in Its Rightful Place. She's a pastor and founding member of the Emerging Church Movement. Her website is danielleschroyer.com. That's D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E-S-H-R-O-Y-E-R.com. This has been The Science of Magic. For in-depth exploration of leading-edge subjects from numerous authorities and viewpoints, join our email family to receive our topic-driven episode collections at thescienceofmagic.net. Love to hear from you. Comments, questions, suggestions, email me at the info at the science of magic.net. Till next time, dear ones, may you be blessed with knowledge and comforted with love as you embrace the original blessing. <laughs>